Lake Superior. It lives up to its name when it comes to scuba diving. Locations such as Munising and Whitefish Bay offer excellent diving. But there is one area that is truly superior, Isle Royale. The waters surrounding the island are among the clearest found in the Great Lakes. Navigation around the island can be hazardous due to the shallow reefs and foggy conditions. It's not uncommon to see various types of wildlife. Over 1,600 moose now inhabit the island, mainly due to the area's decreasing wolf population. Much of the island's wildlife have reached the island by crossing the 13-mile stretch on ice packs during the winter months. Fox, though elusive, are often seen making their daily rounds visiting area campsites in search of an easy meal. Public ferries transport visitors, while seaplanes and dive charters are other ways to access the island. The truly adventurous arrive by private boat. Whichever method you use, all are required to register at one of two ranger stations. Isle Royale is noted for its excellent hiking trails, while many enjoy its excellent fishing. But ask any diver, and they will tell you the most spectacular sights are not on shore, but lie beneath the cold waters surrounding Isle Royale. Altogether, 10 major wrecks encompass the island, most of which are within sport diving limits. Our story will tell of four. The America, the Chester A. Congdon, the Emperor, and the Kamloops. We begin our story with the America, the little ship that could. For over a quarter century, the America was a welcome sight along the Lake Superior shoreline. Built in 1898 as a package and passenger freighter, her travels extended from Duluth to Thunder Bay, as well as Isle Royale. At a length of 182 feet, the America was one of the smallest, yet busiest ships on the Great Lakes, poking her bow into every crack in the shoreline. For many, she was the only link they had to the outside world, bringing news and needed supplies to the people of the North Shore. In her 27 years, she completed over 2,000 round trips with only a dozen minor mishaps. But on June 7, 1928, her luck changed. While leaving Washington Harbor, she struck the rocky bottom in North Gap Channel. With the ship taking on water, a mate attempted to run her aground to prevent her sinking. This allowed the 10 passengers and 30 crew members to escape unharmed. As time passed, the America slid back into Lake Superior, where she now rests on a 45 degree angle with her bow in four feet and her stern in 80 feet of water. Sport divers first visited the America around 1956 when her decks were still littered with tables, chairs, and other artifacts which have now either fallen prey to Father Time or souvenir hunters. Today, the ships and their artifacts are under the protection of the National Park Service, which patrols and monitors all who dive them. As we move through her rooms, we can imagine how passengers danced into the night to the sound of the old grand piano that now lies silent on the ballroom floor. The ship is a testament to an earlier era when a slower pace allowed time for fine craftsmanship. Ornate iron and woodwork trims the ceiling of the salon. A team member examines some of the intricate handiwork surrounding the room and admires the fine carpentry used to raise the ceiling which provided additional ambient lighting.
As we exit the ballroom, we ascend toward the bow and follow a trail of debris. A staircase reveals itself and we are compelled to explore it. Our curiosity pays off as we discover a large dining room where passengers were treated to elegant meals of steak, white fish and trout as part of their $6 round trip fare. Remnants of a sink and stove still remain in the galley. As we observe a single unbroken pane of glass, it's ironic to think that something so fragile has survived the destruction this steel ship has endured. We proceed out of the dining area and reascend the staircase. Every room of the America is accessible, although some of the passageways remain narrow and dark, including this entry into the engine room. The America's boilers were manually stoked with coal to power the 700 horsepower triple expansion steam engine, which still displays a hand-painted American flag. As the America lay helpless near the shore, winter ice took its toll, slowly chiseling away at her superstructure, destroying her forward cabins and dislodging her smokestack, which now lies on her port side in 80 feet of water. As we negotiate the labyrinth of plumbing left behind as the skeletal remains of the ship's superstructure, a diver directs us to enter a passage to the crew's quarters. Our investigation reveals that a single sink was used to wash off the day's grease and grime before retiring to their bunks. Divers' bubbles, which have collected at the ceiling, have created an envelope of air which can be penetrated briefly for a simple diversion. The crew's bunks are just aft of the wash area, where they would often be rocked to sleep while underway.
As we arrive at the deck winch, we reluctantly end our dive. Glancing up at our service crew, we are anxious to share our experience. We leave the America hoping that other divers will come to enjoy her as much as we have. Traveling to the northeast end of the island, let's continue our story with a dive on the Chester A. Congdon. The broken off bow with pilot house intact nearly stands on end and lies in 110 feet of water. The rest of her settled on the other side of the shoal with her stern in over 240 feet of water. The Congdon departed Fort William in the wee hours of the morning, November 6, 1918. The ship was downbound and fully loaded with nearly 400,000 bushels of grain. By the time she steamed past Thunder Cape Light, gale force winds had caused heavy seas. At 4 a.m., the Chester Congdon came about and anchored to wait out the storm. By mid-morning, the seas had calmed and the ship proceeded down the lake. Rounding Thunder Cape, the Congdon encountered a dense fog so prevalent on Lake Superior. The captain set course and speed that would navigate the ship on a timed run to Passage Island. Once there, if fog persisted, they had planned to wait until their true position could be confirmed. Unfortunately, the ship strayed off course and struck a rock shoal, which now bears her name. The Congdon is a pleasurable dive, although the angle she lies on can cause some disorientation. Poking around in her numerous windows and doors gives one a real feeling of what it was like to be part of her crew back in 1918. Adventuresome divers can penetrate every room of the wreck, but are reminded to use safe diving practices. Be careful. Think before you act. Take no chances. Better slow than sorry. A step in the dark is dangerous. Heeding the warnings, we proceed with utmost caution, our lights piercing the darkness that shrouds the awesome stern wheel of the Chester Congdon. Small details such as the wheel's steering indicator are difficult to recall after a dive to this depth. Grabbing hold of the wheel, one can sense the enormous power of a ship this size. Working our way back to the shallows, we feel privileged to witness artifacts from an earlier time, such as this spittoon lying in an open doorway. The ascent line is a welcome sight after a long, cold dive. But we all know there's 45 minutes of decompression stops in 36 degree water before we can surface. Cold and tired, we head back to the island, enjoying its splendor all along the way. A walk up the trail to camp 
and a good meal helps pass the time between dives. Along the way, we take time to appreciate the natural beauty Isle Royale has to offer. Relaxed and refreshed, we take to the water and set course to the next chapter in our story. Launched in 1910 at a length of 525 feet, the Emperor was the largest ship built in Canada. But even her massive size did not save her or 11 of her 30 crewmen from a watery grave. On June 4, 1947, the same miscalculation which sank the Chester A. Congdon 29 years earlier also claimed the Emperor. Although radar had been invented and was used by the military, it was not yet implemented by commercial shipping operations in the Great Lakes. Such equipment would have most certainly averted this disaster. Here on the stern of this great vessel, a diver takes advantage of her fallen stack to gain access to the boiler room. Tracking the diver by following his bubbles, we approach a ventilator where he reappears to take advantage of an excellent photo opportunity. Maneuvering through a doorway reveals a cramped cabin shared by four of the Emperor's crew. Upon closer inspection, we notice a footlocker filled with personal possessions. Following the starboard gangway, we circle around the fantail and reach a depth of 140 feet while passing over a spare prop blade and drag anchor still secured to the port rail. Descending into the engine room, we return to a depth of 130 feet. Here in the engine room, a panel displayed all of the ship's electrical information at a glance. The engine room was also home to the auxiliary steering wheel.
Swimming over the galley skylight, we make our way past the foghorn, which undoubtedly sounded in vain, calling out to a rock shoal, which could not answer. The emperor's powerful bow winches lay idle as a dive member inspects the steel cable which once hoisted cargo from her holds. In search of her great anchors, we dive over the starboard side and follow the huge chain to its source. Venturing over the port side, we find the second anchor nestled closely to her hull. Penetration on the bow section is minimal. The wreckage covers a large area, so a personal dive vehicle can be an asset. The Emperor is one wreck that offers so much variety that we're happy to return to her again and again. The America, the Chester A. Congdon, the Emperor, and our final chapter, the Kamloops. Descending to a depth of 175 feet, we begin our exploration on her port rail and swim over her chine. Sport divers discovered her whereabouts in 1977, near 12 o'clock point, lying on her starboard side at a depth of 270 feet. Dropping down, we take time to photograph her prop. Here, the darkness looms all about, and our lights aid us in shaking off tunnel vision that accompanies the narcosis produced by cold waters and extreme depths. The bone-chilling cold reminds us of her ill-fated crew. On December 6, 1927, while waiting out a storm, an impatient captain gave the command to leave the security of Whitefish Bay and set course for Thunder Bay, Ontario. As Superior's waves crashed over her bow, the ice-entombed ship lost her stack just short of her destination. After making it past the perilous rock shoals of Isle Royale, she vanished without a trace. Sighting the wheel, we refocus our attention to the dive and converge upon it. We find the binnacle at its side where the compass would have been kept in fair weather. Here a diver can experience the ultimate thrill of wreck diving. Few have witnessed these sights before. But what of the missing crew? It's been said, Lake Superior never gives up her dead. As we explore further and proceed into the engine room, not only do we find total darkness, but also the answers.
Sponsored in part by Viking, the choice of professionals.